welcome to uh, quick start serverless with uh, AWS. So today's plan is we're going to be creating a uh, REST API uh, that allows you to retrieve memos. So it's going to allow you to um, take a, a, just like a post-it note, take a memo, you're going to be able to store that memo, read that memo, update that memo, and delete that memo. So um, it's a super simple, uh, easy to follow introduction to uh, serverless and um, kind of the, the whole paradigm of not having to think about what you're running on, just thinking about the code function by function. Cool. So um, we're going to start out by creating uh, a serverless project. So we're going to go um, and use serverless. Running that command, we're going to be uh, prompted to create a new project. Uh, we do want to create a new project, and we want to create one that's using Node.js. And let's just call it uh, serverless memos. It will ask if you want to enable uh, monitoring, etc. It can be useful, but as this is a quick example, we're just going to say no. Cool. So uh, now we can go into serverless memos, and we can see we have uh, two files here. So I'll go ahead and open that up in my uh, VS Code. We're going to open that. <coughs> Uh, and you can see we have two files, our handler.js and uh, our serverless.yml. If you're following along with the uh, GitHub repo, then you can take a look. This is what we find in the initial folder. Um, so you can see in here we've uh, got our service, which is serverless memos, uh, running on AWS. Serverless as a framework does support things like Azure, Google Cloud, uh, but this specific example is going to be on AWS. Uh, we're using Node, as I said earlier, and you'll see we have one function in here, which is our uh, hello function. Um, so you can see that the handler for this hello function is uh, here in our handler.js. We have uh, it exports hello, and in here we have handler, as in handler.js, and then hello. Um, so from here, our, our kind of goal is to begin to build out uh, this RESTful API. And we're going to be calling our REST API through HTTP. So of course, we're going to need to um, enable the running of uh, this function through HTTP. So down here in the uh, function, you can see that there is an option events. Um, there's a ton of different ways that you can trigger events using serverless. These are uh, these functions map onto AWS's Lambda functions. Um, so you can trigger lambdas in a whole bunch of ways. The way we're going to be using today is HTTP, but you can also do things like React to CloudWatch events, Alexa, IoT, etc. So um, super versatile, super flexible. We're going to be using, as I said, HTTP. Uh, and we're just going to call this run hello for now. Um, so we can see that we have our path is run hello. We're using a GET request uh, within our handler. What's going to happen when we call this is it's going to return a 200 status code, so everything's OK. And the body is going to be a brief message saying that we executed our function, and it's going to return the uh, event that we triggered that with. So you can see we're in our, uh, our serverless directory here. We're going to run. SLS, which is just shorthand for serverless, and we're going to run deploy. 
please let me know in either the uh, workshop channel or in the Twitch chat if text is too small, etc. I can I can resize all of that for you. So you can see it's creating our stack. This is going to be configuring things like API Gateway, which acts as kind of ingress control for uh, our Lambda functions, building our Lambda functions, etc. Um, so this essentially abstracts away a whole bunch of complicated configuration that you would normally do in JSON with um, cloud formation and that kind of stuff. This is just simplifying it down YML file, we can kind of build from basics here. So it takes a little minute to deploy because it has to upload your file and then um, deploy out. The whole paradigm, we can talk about this briefly, the whole paradigm behind these um, serverless functions is, as I said, you don't have to think about um, what you're running on, you just write the code and the back end handles your kind of scaling and stuff automatically. So you can see we've deployed. Um, we've deployed to US East 1 region, that's default. Um, and we've deployed our run hello route. So if we click on the run hello route, then you can see that we have our go serverless, your function executed successfully. Woohoo! Uh, there's also ton of other information in here. Most of this is going to prove irrelevant for us, um, today at least. However, there are a couple of things which uh, it's very useful to point out. So in other kinds of HTTP requests, such as uh, post requests, put requests, uh, the body here would be uh, a member of event. Uh, and then there's also these things called path parameters, which uh, are extremely useful when we're designing RESTful APIs because it allows us to put variables in the path here without using a query string. So um, now that we've kind of managed to get our HTTP response up and running, we're going to have to start building out our RESTful API portion. Um, to briefly explain RESTful, a lot of people have this kind of misconception that RESTful uh, is always HTTP driven or um, is all to do with URLs, etc. That's not the case. RESTful is more of a set of principles that dictate how an API will function. So it is five principles that can make any API of any, uh, not any format, any format as long as they adhere to the five principles will be considered RESTful. So the five principles are uh, contract first, which means that the client and the server have an agreement about a common interface. And neither of them need to know about their counterparts implementation as long as the interface is correct. So as you put a memo in, for example, if I store my memo at, uh, as I gave an example in the readme, if you store the memo at 123, that memo object should always be accessible at 123 for as long as it exists. If that format changes, then it means that the, the API is no longer RESTful as it's broken its contract. The second principle is statelessness. So it's the idea that every request to the API does not rely on any context from previous requests to be a valid request. So this is not always intuitive to us as humans because humans have a, a very kind of implicit way of talking to each other. So if you imagine this as language, you couldn't ask the, the client couldn't ask the server, have you watched Breaking Bad? This, they can ask that, server says yes, you can't go on to ask, what did you think? Because the server doesn't understand. 
you have to ask explicitly what did you think of Breaking Bad after you had that initial confirmation that the server had watched it. So we're not relying on any previous request to build our future responses. The third point is um, the client server model. So you have no idea, as I said, about the underlying implementation of each side, but the client knows that the server is going to respond in a format it can understand, and the server knows that the client will submit requests in a format it can understand. Um, we also have this really interesting idea of uh, what's referred to as granularity here. So it's how how much information is relevant and should be returned for a given request. For example, if I ask for a memo, I don't necessarily need to know every single previous time that memo was accessed, but I do need to know the contents because I want to fetch that. So it's a lot of thinking, most of it common sense, but thinking about what you need to respond with in any given situation. After that we have uh, caching as a principle. So this might sound like it goes completely against my previous principle about statelessness. Um, however, caching and statelessness can go hand in hand because the cache does not provide any context to the, the restful portion of the API whenever it's accessed. So if you run a query that's never been run before, that's going to hit the RESTful API and be processed without any interaction with the cache. However, if the request has been serviced before, what's going to happen is the API is bypassed and the cache is hit instead. This is not something we necessarily need to think about a lot uh, in our particular implementation today because it will be mostly handled automatically by API Gateway, but it's good to be aware of it and aware of why it's not mutually exclusive with statelessness. And then our final principle is layered architecture. Kind of again coming back to that contract type idea, um, you're getting a layered approach. Think of it as a cake. The each layer is not aware of anything other than the layer on either side of it. So you only need to have that interface um, that you, you know about. So the underlying implementation of any layer can change, but as long as it provides the same interface, that is fine. After that brief kind of tangent into what is and isn't considered uh, RESTful, it's important to say that our API today is going to be an HTTP-based RESTful API. We're going to use what's considered fairly standard practice um, within RESTful HTTP APIs in terms of we're using a POST for creation, a PUT for update, a GET to retrieve, and a DELETE to delete. However, I do want to stress that if you wanted to use something like a POST for update, that wouldn't preclude your API from being RESTful. It would just mean that you had to be consistent with using POST for update throughout your API. The RESTful principles are designed to ensure consistency. They're not designed to force you down any particular route of implementation. So, moving on into what we're going to do. So we have our existing handler here, uh, our hello handler, but that's not really relevant for what we need anymore. What we need is a create handler so that we can create a new memo. So we're going to use this to create our memos. Now, this large piece of boilerplate code here essentially builds our request for us, uh, our, builds our response for us. So uh, 
we don't want to duplicate this everywhere that we're going to return a response. We want something a bit cleaner than that. So I'd recommend breaking this out into its own function. Um, and that way you can have a much cleaner function signature every time you need to do this. So what we're doing here is we're returning the status code. This is a kind of small JavaScript trick. Um, having just status code, the variable uh, here, is equivalent to having status code, status code. Just because they're the same name, uh, you can shorten it down to one. And then in our body, we don't want this fixed body. We want to stringify our body object. So this is going to be the part where we create our memo. Um, and we're going to want to return our body and for now let's just make that 200 with uh, an empty response. What we're going to have to do in this create memo uh, here is we're going to have to build an ID for each memo. For this what we're going to do is we're going to go to our console and we're going to install the UUID package. So that package, once we import it, is going to allow us to create a UUID for each memo. And we're using a v4 UUID because that's just a random UUID. Uh, and then we'll return our memo ID here. Then we're going to want to create similar boilerplate functions for read, update, and delete. Now, we're going to leave these with their memo IDs for the moment. However, we're going to come back and change the value of them in a minute once we've changed some things in the serverless.yml. So what we need to change here now is we obviously have several different functions. We have our uh, we have our create, read, update, and delete, commonly referred to as CRUD. Um, and we're going to have to create a handler for each of them. So create is going to be at create. But for the other ones, we're going to need a way of telling the function what memo we are referring to when we're trying to uh, kind of alter them or access them or any of those kind of things. So we're going to create our read handler and we're going to make our path curly braces with ID in the middle. This format here allows you to create what's called a path parameter. So you'll end up with something like myurl.com slash and then whatever comes after the slash in this case one two three four is going to be our ID. And we're able to access that from inside our function. Another important thing to note is this method. Method refers to the HTTP method. We're going to use a different one for each operation that we're looking to, trans uh, to perform. So for create, it's going to be post. For read, it's going to be get. For update, it's going to be put for delete. It's just delete. Let's change our handle names accordingly. Cool. So now that we have this, we're able to go back into our handler and we're able to change in these ones the 
memoid to be event.path parameters id. And in all of these, where we are going to edit what the contents of the memo are, we're also going to need to reference the contents of our request. So in this case, we're going to parse what we previously mentioned, the event body. And this is going to contain our contents. We don't need to do this in read, because we're fetching by the parameter ID. But to update, we also need this. Now, as a kind of check to see that this is working, what we're going to do is we're going to deploy this again. Now that this is deployed, we can see that we have several different URLs, one for each handler. What we're going to do is we're going to take this URL and we're going to open Insomnia and just as a sanity check, we're going to put the contents in here and we're going to check that it comes out with the UUID on the right. So that's great. This has generated a UUID, and although we're not storing anything yet, this is along the right track. So now that we've got our handlers in here, and we've got our kind of IDs being generated, we're going to need to move in to actually storing some data. And this is where things can become a little fiddly if you're using um, a fixed database and, and it's not serverless and you can't really scale. But luckily serverless kind of takes care of most of that for us. So down here you can see we have a section called resources. Um, what we're going to have to do here is we're going to have to add uh, a database. Amazon Web Services in particular is very useful because they provide DynamoDB, which is a scalable database and should be perfect for our uh, use. It's document-based, it has no fixed schema, it sounds ideal. So you're going to want to add in resources here. And at this point, you need to declare your table. So we're going to call ours memo table then the type of our table is going to be a DynamoDB table. Then in our properties, we have to again declare the formal table name. And for anything that we want to use as a key, you have to declare it in the attribute definitions. For us, we're going to be using memo ID. And then our attribute type here is going to be S for string. And then again, you need to declare your key schema, which uses these attributes here. The important thing is
that for any attribute that you put in the, the attribute definitions, you have to have a key schema attribute associated with that. However, you don't need to have an item in the attribute definitions to be able to store that in the document. So there's this kind of distinction between the key, which is necessary in every document, and without it, the document can't be created, uh, that's used for searching through documents, and then the contents of the document, apart from that key, can be kind of whatever you want. So again, in here, we're going to use uh, our uh, memo ID as our key, uh, and then you need a key type. This, for our purposes, which is uh, using a string as a key, is going to be a hash. Then lastly, you need to provide some capacity for your database. So we're just going to put that at 1. Excellent. So here we have our table. This will be created when you run deploy. Now there's a couple of other things that are important that we have to do. First of all, we want our program to be able to easily access our table name. So we're going to create an environment variable up here where it gives you the option to create an environment variable. And we're just going to call it memo table because that's what we named our table below. The other thing that we have to do here is we have to grant the user, which is your IAM user that you previously uh, kind of used and created in the prerequisites. And you have to grant, as I said, some permissions to allow it to access that DynamoDB table. So rather than typing all this out by hand, I'm going to copy it in from the config file here, and then I'm going to explain what it does. So what this does is it allows the user, the IAM user, which is the user that your functions are running under, to access various elements of the DynamoDB associated with it. You can get more granular control by changing the resource name here, but for the kind of ease of use and setup of this, we just need to know that we need the ability to get items, query items, insert items, update items, and delete items. So this is kind of where we are at a base level for this. Now, we're going to need another library to do this, and that library is called AWS SDK. So again, open up your console, and you're going to want to install AWS SDK. Then you're going to want to import it. And what we're going to want to do here is uh, access our DynamoDB. So you're going to want a client to do that. <coughs> and now we need to work on inserting the contents of our memos into the database. So what you need is you need to reference your table name in your data. And this, because we declared it as an environment variable, we can access through this value here. Then what you need is you want the item to be inserted. For us, we're going to use, again, that kind of trick where if your key is the same 
as the variable name. You don't need to put the semicolon in. We're going to want to insert some memo contents, which are going to be submitted in the body of our post request. And then we're going to store a created date. And you could go on to store things like the date when this was last updated, but I'll leave that as kind of an exercise for you later on. So now what you need to do is we're going to need to insert this into the database. For this, the DynamoDB method is put. So we're going to want to put our data into the database. And because we're using the newer uh, serverless implementation with async events, we're going to use promises here rather than callbacks because that ensures that you wait for the completion of the put before you exit. So we're going to want to do that. Uh, if we can't successfully handle it, then we're going to have to kind of feedback that we've had a bit of an issue. So that's going to be a 500 because something went wrong on our end. Uh, and we're just going to say that it was unsuccessful. However, if we can do it, then what we're going to do is we're going to say it's successful. And that's a 200 because everything went okay. And in fact, what we can also do here is we can return our memo ID because for subsequent requests, you're going to need to know what the memo is called. So now that we've got that, what we're going to do is we're going to deploy our service. This might take slightly longer this time because remember you've got to wait for a serverless to deploy your database stack as well. Um, but what we're kind of doing is we're building it up piece by piece in terms of functionality. So it's going to allow us to kind of incrementally increase our understanding of what's going on. So Yolabsi asks, any way to test the lambdas locally before deploying? The answer to that is kind of yes and no. Yes, you can test individual functions using serverless. There's a command to do so. Um, but they don't interact properly necessarily with your resources that you would find um, when you deploy to your stack. The other thing to mention about this in terms of testing is that um, you'll see within here um, in your serverless.yml you have this stage variable. So the default is dev for development which is your testing environment. But if you were to want to deploy something to production, you can do SLS deploy and then set your stage to prod. And where it says dev in here, it would be prod for production. And you'd be able to then stage on your dev environment and test there while leaving your production environment kind of unaffected. Um, but for that, you would need to also set the name of your table to be slightly different for production and uh, development. And I can kind of give you more details about that later if, if that's something that you wish to know. Um, but anyway, we're now back to creating our memo. We've created it. And we can see that our memo ID here, 3b9a, And if we go into our memo table here on the AWS console, we can see that we've inserted this. We've got the contents. This is my memo. And we created it a couple seconds ago. Now what we need to do is be able to access this kind of locally uh, through our API without having to log into the AWS console. So what we're going to do is we're going to 
use our read handler here to search up the database and, and check if we have the necessary memo to return. So again, same format for every DynamoDB query. You're going to need to have the table name as your first, uh, not necessarily your first argument, but it doesn't need to be the table name named argument. Um, and then for this one, we're going to use uh, key here rather than item because we're querying. So our key is going to be our memo ID, which we fetched again from that path parameter that we talked about earlier. Um, and that's going to allow us to look up similar to above. So this time, we're going to use get, which is the fetching command. And what we're going to do is we're going to create this variable called result, which is going to contain our um, the result of our promise. So in the case of result returning something valid, we're going to return uh, result dot item dot memo contents however if result doesn't find anything then it means that the document's not found so that's obviously a, a 404 So this way, what we can do is if we find the result, then we return its contents. If we don't find the result, then we say, it, look, it's not found. And then if there's an error, we return a 500 because something went wrong inside. I'll deploy that while we work on the next two functions. Um, update is a kind of interesting uh, function because where we had uh, previously only a couple values in our query, you need to be much more specific when you're running uh, an update. So starts off just like a, a read because you need to grab the same thing. However, um, it resembles SQL more closely uh, as you kind of get into how you set the values and and stuff like that um, here. The other thing that we're going to be adding here is what's called a condition expression. This dictates when you're able to run this command. And for us, we want to make sure that the memo exists, which we do by ensuring that the ID exists in the database. If it doesn't, then it won't run. If we didn't have this condition expression, what the update command would do is, if the memo didn't exist in the database, it would create it, which may be useful in some cases, but in this specific implementation, we want to kind of make a distinction between create and update. And then for our SQL type argument above, we need to define what our variables are. So we're going to use, again, that, that contents from the body. And then we don't want the update to return anything. And what we're going to do is similar to above, in that we're going to call update. 
and we don't need the new contents because we've just submitted them, so we're just going to say that it was a successful response. So, while we've done that, we've had the opportunity to deploy our read function. So, now we can test that out in Insomnia here. And what we're going to do is we're going to grab our URL and we're going to replace the final parameter with our new UUID, which we got from our create function. So this then, oh, I've used the wrong URL, but when you go through and grab this value, what's going to happen is we're going to fetch the um, fetch the memo from the database. Then we're going to return it as our result there. So this needs to be our query. And while this deploys, what we're going to do is we're going to build up our delete here. So delete, again, very similar to the other database operations, uh, shares a lot in common with get. So we're going to use the same query. This time we don't need the result. We're just deleting it if it exists, and we're doing nothing if it doesn't. Again, if there's an error, we want to make it very clear that it's not something the user did, it's something internal. So now that I've fixed the query, we've got our memo contents that we originally submitted. Of course, all these URLs are the same because they're formatted in the same way. And the difference here in Insomnia is in the top left, we've got our request type. Or if you're creating new requests from scratch, you've got it here on the right. So again, post for create, get for read, put for update, and delete to delete. So we're now looking to update. We've got Currently, the contents are, this is my memo. We want to update that to altered memo. Which I can grab from here. Again, we're going to want to deploy that out. Now, this is the part where it becomes relevant that you only need to declare what your keys are because it allows you to add, if, if at some point you wanted to add last updated, you're able to just add that. You don't need to go in and redefine your database schema and do a whole bunch of other kind of operational things. Because it's a document-based database, it allows you to be extremely flexible with how you use it and 
kind of where you take your objects after you initially declare them. Um, let's see, have we finished deploying? Yes. So now we've updated our existing memo and you can see that the contents are altered memo. So we've successfully updated. And then here in the last, we've got our kind of delete is essentially a get with a different function, um, almost identical code. We're gonna take our same URL again because these HTTP methods are the distinction. And we're gonna run that. You can see that this is success. When we go into our DynamoDB console here, in items, we don't have anything anymore. We're no longer able to read it. And that's our kind of finishing point. I'd just like to add that serverless like this, you don't need to limit yourself to just one handler file. Um, if you wanted to create a, a kind of second file, then you can go down that route and all you need to do in here is change this first argument is the file name, you just change it to second, for example. Um, there's tons of cool things. AWS is extremely, extremely flexible. Um, really just go wild. There's, there's anything you want to do. Enjoy hacking with it. If you need any help, then don't be afraid to uh, shoot me a message. Just tag me. I think I'm a JS mentor, but we'll see if we can get a serverless mentor roll up as well. Um, and that's it.